everyone. Welcome to day three of the TMP Motivation Series. Uh, my name is Raymond Bryan um, and we are incredibly excited to be talking with the wonderful human Eric Lamb today. Um, he and I met maybe a few months ago um, after we approached him saying would you like to do um, an improv recording with us which is now on our YouTube. Um, and we've been, you know, hitting it off ever since, just doing lots of really interesting things. Um, I think that Eric is an amazing uh, flute player, an amazing musician, amazing person to talk to. They're um, just tuning in right now, so I'll give them a little wave. And um, yeah, I'm incredibly excited to be talking with him today. So um, we'll just wait for um, wait for him to arrive, and then we can get going. I hope everyone is looking after themselves today and keeping warm on certainly what is in the UK, a very cold day today. I'm drinking a lemon tea. <laughs> right, here we are. I should be, should be joining us any second. Um. <clears throat> Let's see if I can invite him. There we are, he's tuning in just now. Hey! Hello, hi! It, it, oh shit, what, how do I do this? <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, I'm gonna put you right there. Is that good? Perfect, Can you see me? perfect, yeah. Yeah. The, you've got a nice ball of sun coming from there. Yeah, which is like actually not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> like a, a meteor or something. Yeah, exactly. But no, the problem is, is that it's like such a large light fixture that it's really bad for these sorts of scenarios because it's like backlighting. So I'll just hold you. <laughs> okay, How about that? That's cool. I, I be... <laughs> yeah, take us on the ride. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about some things that are going on in the music world and some, you know, it'd be lovely to hear your take on a few, a few things that we kind of talked about before as well. Um, yeah. And I mean, maybe, maybe I can just shoot right into it. Um, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, one of the things Here. that, cheers. Got a lemon tea, yeah. <laughs> That's not lemon tea. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those days, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess there's been a lot of tension, certainly in the UK, between you know how do we make music relevant in a COVID world? There's been a lot of, yeah. you know, there's I, what's been highlighted certainly for me is, I mean, we have technology, which is fantastic, but there's, there's definitely been a resistance between trying to connect with audiences again and kind of, I hate to say it, but, you know, prove our worth in a way as musicians as to, you know, mm -hmm. why do we need to, no, why, why should people be interested in what we do? And I was just wondering what your, what your take in, is on that. Yeah. You know, it, it is, it is, I, mean, I don't know what the situation is like in UK I, living in Austria. It's a bit different, mm. but like, I do see that like it becomes, it becomes an issue like is it is what we do as artists um essential mm -hmm. is it um but a friend of mine um got married recently um super heteronormative but i love them very much and the 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 topic we got um, later that evening the conversation went to a sort of system relevance you know like looking big picture like if what is what we do as artists relevant to the the larger system that that's in place you know mm -hmm. and i mean I, I think the biggest question particularly in the place where i like like where i live where it's like the institutionalized music making versus um what i find is much more interesting the sort of um rogue chamber music new music um you know put a music stand in the middle of the room and rock out sort of Thing. And what you know, what's the relevance? Like, is it is it is the institution more relevant because there's money behind it, or is it really about the making of art that's important? Mm. You know, mm. um, here it's been really interesting. Like, since things have well, I mean, they're getting worse again. But there was during the summer, um, I was quite active playing 
and it was interesting to me that like these small these small ships of art making mm. like new music ensembles chamber ensembles were ready to go you know mm. i mean if i play for a room full of more than 50 people i'm like shocked mm. anyway because <laughs> but it doesn't mean that it's important just because people people don't come it's often a matter of how the institution sort of like how it sits inside of the greater artistic landscape mm. you know what i mean mm. yeah and it's all relevant and it's all important what i find very interesting is that these days you know people are coming to concerts people are wanting to connect to people i mean it's 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 the whole environment and atmosphere around uh, art making that's important it's mm. not yes the music for me is the center of it because it's what i produce but for the general public, it's about, you know, leaving their stressful jobs and getting on the train and putting on a nice pair of shoes and going to meet their friends and maybe having dinner before or after and maybe hearing something provocative or witnessing or being a part of something that's interesting that that um, sparks conversation in a different direction. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. And I mean, of course, that's like, that's like, a certain kind of person, a certain kind of art goer. But, you know, what's been interesting about this time is not just affected us, it's affected the dance community, it's affected the, the, the visual art community, um, actors and actresses, um, it's affected us all. And I think that like, what we're seeing or what I'm seeing is that like artistically, we're all really much more intertwined and connected than we are siloed through academia to become, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what I'm just sort of witnessing and noticing, and yeah, 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 experiencing. It's it's definitely been a time um, where we've had a bit of a a period of self reflection and a period of you know reassessing. You know how do we deliver, and also how do we connect with audiences? And for me, it's been quite interesting having the time to reflect and really listen to different art forms and you know because we're all coming from different um you know different mediums and you know there's there's a way that we can try and connect more i think um mm -hmm. to you know visual artists and like you said you know rocking up to you know in the middle of a field or <laughs> wherever you want to want to, to play i i find that mm -hmm. so much more interesting in a way to you know mm -hmm. the more the structural let's go to a concert at 6 p.m. and, you know, we're going to sit and we're going to pretend to be very serious and knowledgeable. But th those things are also important. They're also important culturally, I think, mm. you know, mm. to have this, this, this like historical reflection on what has become how we um, internalize and receive um, artistic information, mm. you know, like going to within four walls and with a stage and there is historical relevance to that but what i think that what what was happening inside and hopefully outside of this is that the larger conversation will be um what else mm. you know and and that what else um how is it also important and relevant and how can it be supported potentially um because as i say like i see the the independent art scene flourishing because that's where the creativity is, yeah. to be quite honest. Yeah. You know, for me personally, I was like, lock me in a room, give me a flute and access to the internet and I will I will get the party started, mm. you know? <laughs> well, that's how I came across to you. Yeah, in, um, you know, your Red um, red Sofa series, um, where you, you, yeah. you know, you just use the materials that were right there in lockdown and it was a way to, you know, I loved it. I heard a load of new flute music that I hadn't heard before, before and, you know, it was, it was a lovely way to, um, certainly for me, to kind of have a, a, a different way of accessing music. I like that. Yeah, for me, it was super important. I mean, it was a, it was a temporary thing. You know, I, didn't plan, I, I didn't plan on making this my life's work, of course. It's a part of a whole, but like, and you know, I, no one, I didn't get any personal, like, lashback about like doing something that's like not monetary, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, but that that was that was a, a general danger and a general like conversation that a lot of artists were having. Like, if you make your work available for free, does that mean that you are you know um, devaluing devaluing the your art? And you know, I don't, I, I didn't see it as that at, at all. And to be quite frank, it's an artist's business to disseminate their their work in whatever way they feel that they need to. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And 
Um, I did take a little bit, you know, it was, it, it was n never any direct criticism from, but just from living in the world and seeing how other people react to other people. Um, that was a conversation that was being had. And, you know, I, f I felt strongly that this is what I needed to do in this time mm. because I had the time finally, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and I, I chose the methods. I chose the means. I chose how I disseminated it. And I, I chose what was disseminated, you know, mm. Mm. and, and I, you know, I, that's generally a mantra that I have, you know, and I tell young people, <clears throat> I'm such an old man sometimes, I think. Um, I, I tell people this all the time. I'm like, you know, you know, the world is how the world is. And if, you, if you're sitting inside of it and you want to create something, create something and mm. do it on your own terms. Because mm. if you create it, nobody can take it away from you, mm. you know? Yeah. Absolutely. It's yours. And I think that I, I, I'm hoping that like in the co coming months and years after all of this cray cray, like sorts of sort of balances itself out and we learn how to deal with this new state of living, this new cultural way of being, yeah. um, mm -hmm. this collective way of being that like um, maybe that conversation will be had in places where it needs to be had, like in schools and academia and, mm. you know, mm. Because I was thinking, because you know, you've you've inspired me a lot in the last in the last while since we've been in contact. Because it's nice to see young people like getting off their asses and doing something, you know. Mm. And but maybe it's generational. I'm I'm you know, maybe two generations above you. But like when I was coming out of school, a lot of I studied in Germany also, which is not like it's just what it is, you know. A lot of people have an overwhelming sense of entitlement in the music world mm. you know mm. it's like they are they feel very entitled to have things you right know? right um not saying that that doesn't say that they don't work for it but like they it's like this one-to-one -one ratio is sort of like i put this in i get this out mm. you know interesting yeah and for me as a black man that was never a thing mm. you know what i mean mm. like i was never gonna walk into an audition and win because i played the best you know that's just not how the world works anymore, unfortunately, you know? Um, and, but in school, people are fed that, you know? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they're fed this, like, notion that the best person in the room gets the job. It's this idealized yeah. reality, which is not reality at all, mm. you know? Mm. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and so I'm hoping that, like, this will be this conversation will start to happen where it needs to happen, mm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on how we can increase inclusivity and make it a level playing field? Because, you know, as you said, there's so much coming from, especially from larger institutions. They have the money, they have the kind of pillars that they believe in. And, you know, a lot of that is really misogynistic and a really you know racially and you know gender and you know all of these things it's not a level playing field and i i want to yeah. know you know because i fully acknowledge you know as a person that's come up with a lot of you know I'm, a very privileged lifestyle and you know how can we increase inclusivity and try and create a more level playing field in the classical music world yeah, I mean, that's the million dollar question, right? Yeah. Particularly these days. It's just like the question. Mm. And I don't think there is one answer. I mean, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine who's here singing a, a project and from Belgium. And it was lovely to sit and talk to her. Um, uh, it, she's, she's British and a black woman and a singer and a pedagogue and lives in Ghent. And we were discussing just that, you know, like what, what are the methods mm. in which we can have this sort of, you know, Inclusion. I mean, it, it's. I think it really matters where we go first and where we look to, like what institutions we look to to start having these conversations. But you know, I think of there's this American television show that I absolutely hate called The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> I know it's awful for me to say because people love it, but like I think it's ridiculous because it's one of these television shows that that really talks about and features the like cliche after cliche after cliche, mm. you know, yeah. like the disgendered, the disgendered or um, demasculated Asian man and the, you know, the closet homosexual and all these things. It's sort of like clear to me that there's, there's no Asian people, there are no, there are no black people, there are no women writing this stuff, mm. right? Mm. And if you want to fix that, that's where you go. 
You go where the the real work is quote unquote being or should be, be being done, mm -hmm. you know, to create, to have the real dialogue. And I feel that like, you know, I look at these academic institutions. I'm at that age now where I'm, I'm teaching at a university and I think about these things. And, you know, I look at the faculties and it's just like the most undiverse, not even just racially, but sexually, gender wise, um, religion wise, um, aesthetics, um, you, they create these like monochromatic one dimensional um, fake realities. Mm -hmm. And they expect young people to funnel their way through and then out and then what do they get out of it? You know, they get yet again, a puffed up false sense of what reality is. Mm -hmm. And then they enter into the world and they have absolutely no idea what to do with themselves, you know? Yeah. And yeah. It, takes, it takes them a long time, it, particularly if they're not in one of these like really privileged um, cultural centers, like you know Austria or in Germany or so. It takes them a long time to find, you know, to fill around and figure out what's really what because they haven't been taught anything, mm. you know. Mm. And that was my problem. That you know, I see it all the time, and I say let's just actually start hiring, you know, trans people. There, there are plenty of them in the music industry. Let's start hiring black men and women. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's start hiring people of color in academia because they're out there. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and this is what I love about like your work and like because you know that's the work. It's the work is to go and find it. Mm -hmm. To go and like instead of sitting in your pajamas and like be like being a part of cancel culture, like actually going and doing the work and finding diversity mm. and engaging and connecting. And, you know, like you, my mother always said, like, if you want to get to know someone from a different culture, go and have dinner with them, mm. Mm. you know, mm -hmm. sit at the table with them, this metaphoric, you know, table of diversity. Yeah. And, and then, you know what I mean? Like, and that's the way to do it. I don't think it's rocket science. I've been forced to do it my whole life. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And it's, therefore, it's not my work, it's other people's work, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's, it's, not, it's not difficult, it just requires work and people are fucking lazy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And I think it's, it's such a, a culture now where we use social media and we use, you know, we can use technology for so many bad things as well. It's so easy to, you know, I was talking yesterday a little bit about, um, how on social media we compose, oh, this thing's amazing and this thing's amazing. And we were, you know, we were talking mm -hmm. about um, self-worth versus productivity. And, um, right, and, you know, we, we have these tools where it's so easy to, you know, as you say, the cancel culture, you know, to be able to shunt something off to the side or an algorithm or, you know, a representation that is just not diverse at all. And yeah. it's, a, it's a real, real shame. It really struck me the other day, I was watching um, some, just or, some orchestral recordings on YouTube and every single person was white and middle-aged and mostly men. Mm. And it was just, it was really disheartening. And actually I thought, well, it's, yeah, it's really disheartening and it's horrible. We need to in increase yeah. diversity in so many ways. And that's, the first thing that we can do from, I think is, you know, we, we start the conversation, as you say, um, and we get to know yeah, yeah, people. Yeah. It, it's an yeah, action. Of course. Thing, like, it, 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 and it takes work, you know, recently, you know, I have a YouTube channel like other folks and like, um, and some lovely person was like, Oh, I've never heard of you before. It's so nice to hear your playing. And that's great. But like that for me was like, Oh, I've been at this for a really long time. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, you know, I, I work really hard. I find it interesting that I'm still being discovered. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, that, that means that like people aren't doing that work by like being like, you know, there are, there are, you know, principal flute players and soloists of color. Um, let's go find them, you know? Mm -hmm. but, but that for me, that's like one of those things that like they, they haven't gotten to the place where you've gotten, where you are actually seeing it for what it is and being like, this is a problem, mm. you know? And this can't be, let's actually do some research and see who's out there, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Because they take that to work. Mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, it's from a place of, it's so built into the system that it does require a little bit of work. And that's where maybe the change is coming from. We need to actually do the action and not just kind of wait for something to arrive in our lab. Um, yeah. And I still, you know, I'm, I'm hard on it. 
academia because I think that they, the academia is a place that is where all these things should go down. You know, mm. like it should be happening at the Royal Academy. It should be happening at Guildhall. It should be happening. They should be bringing people like me in to introduce mm. to you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, and 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 that's super important at this that that time. Like, you know, when you're 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, that it is when it, when you get it sorted out. Then, then when you enter into the world, you have a completely different take on things. But mm. if you what you're being fed is so white. Mm -hmm. European, mm -hmm. you know, then it's, and it's their fault. I'm, con I'm convinced of it because m my experience was as a young person, um, I grew up in a very, very segregated city. Detroit, Michigan, in the United States in the 80s and 90s was the most segregated city in the United States. Mm. For, I mean, for me, it was great because I didn't grow up with that, like, sense of, like, um, Michelle Obama actually talks about this in th this documentary. Um, of hers on Netflix. That, we're not being sponsored, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this conversation is not being sponsored. Um, but you know, she you know talks about like you know I because of that growing up in this like really um, segregated place. All um, all my doctors and you know all of our city officials and all my teachers and you know my, my flute teacher was black. So I didn't think I didn't have this like sense that I was less than mm. you know. Mm. Um, and I still don't have that. I'm like, please, you know, I just don't, it does not, it doesn't even compute. Um, but, and because of that, when I was a young boy, there was a African American man who was doing his masters, mm -hmm. um, uh, at the university of Michigan. He came in for uh, a practice of his master's recital. He played in front of us, in front of our band class. And I was like, I can do all that, you know? Mm -hmm. And he looks just like me. Mm. You know, mm. it is possible. And yes, it's great to have, you know, a diverse student body. Very important. You know, it's important for everyone. Mm. But it's also important to have that conversation, like showing them that they that there is a generation above them and even above them who have been doing the work. And that's a direction that's possible for them. Mm. You know? Mm. Yeah. Um, and it is it is work. But like. That, that that's that's the work of the institution that's not my job you mm -hmm. know because yeah. i'm too busy or you're too busy you know what i mean like yeah. mm -hmm. and i would love to see that being sorted out soon mm -hmm. you know and the why not now after like you know because we're finally having these conversations it's finally okay mm -hmm. to to talk about white privilege and to talk openly about um our own privilege because i also am a privileged person you know like that doesn't mean that doesn't strip me of my 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 experience as a black man, but I do know in that I'm I'm a privileged person. I'm very very talented. I'm very successful, and I live in Europe, and I have a white husband, and I I benefit from his privilege. You mm. know, mm. Um, yeah. But I think this is the time because we can have these conversations openly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a time for conversation, and you know, certainly for me as a white person, it's it's time to listen and to find and to you know, hear those experiences. And that's something that I've, you know, been doing a lot of reading and it's it's something that, you know, there's the things that I wouldn't have even computed before. Things, you know, just in terms of audition selection and, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much that's so ingrained into the fabric of the classical world that we need to just shift. And uh, yeah, I just think we need to discuss more and more and more and more and more and listen and actively search out those people. I saw something yeah. recently as well that was like, um, I'm not your um, your trauma porn, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, mm -hmm. like, we, we're not just, um, I don't think we should just be looking for someone to tick a box. You know, all this, like, inclusivity, yeah. like, um, make sure we're representing, you know, that's great in a way, but also... When you know, we shouldn't just hire someone just because they tick a box. We should hire someone because there are so many people out there that are representing all these other communities that aren't being given a level playing for a uh, platform. Yeah, you know, I, I was having this is the exact same conversation I was having today. I find that so interesting. These conversations are so cyclical; they keep coming back over and over again. Mm. You know, mm. like you know, yeah, I'm. It, this is like that James Baldwin, you know, adage, you know, I'm not your Negro. Like, mm. you know, I, I'm the, the whole idea of tokenism is problematic. I think inclusivity and I think the I think that like representation is very important. Mm. But see, that's where the work is. Right. Because yeah. like 
there are a lot of great young um, Asian and African American and African and 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 mm. you know yeah. that that are diverse and come from very interesting backgrounds who are at the top of their game. But often what ends up happening is that the institution finds the one who has the story that fits, mm. you know? Yeah. And then they, and that's all you hear. You mm. hear about this one individual or you hear, and they become the one who's propped up. And unfortunately, sometimes it happens that they, you know, it doesn't last very long because that it's not giving them space to grow, mm. you know? Mm. Um, and then inside, like inside of these, these small collections of people of color who are working really hard, it's sort of like, why this person and why not all these people, mm. you know? Why is there only space for one person, you know? Mm. Like, why is there only space for one story? And I, I don't know, I find that super problematic. I see that a lot happening in, in the UK, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, you know, they, that one person is picked out of, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and you know, no tea, no shade, but like, I find it very problematic because th that exclude, that's like a, a great example of that, like classical music exclusion thing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. By including one person and only one person, you make yourself feel better, but you make everybody else feel terrible because mm. you've excluded people. Yeah, again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because if we, if we look at the idea of diversity, it's, you know, it's not just one person that's going to represent an entire population of people. Um, diversity or everyone's is, story or everyone's experience. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, that, that needs to change from right from mm -hmm. the, the big institutions downwards. And we can, you know, certainly from where I'm coming from, you know, we can try and change that from the inside and we can do the work as you say and you know try and make that but you know you guys are doing the work it's so cool to see you know like you guys are reaching out to people and collaborating i mean and this is where, what it's really about you know like taking people from where they are and what they're about and what they're doing and engaging with them mm. you know not mm. at them yeah you know and <laughs> you know, and you know, I'm, you know, I, when you, when you guys reached out to me to do the improvisation, I was like, yeah, just because that's, in, it's important. It's mm -hmm. important. That's how, that's how I connect with people, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I had never played with you before. And I think it was a wonderful experience, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's sort of like sitting at the table and eating, eating dinner with someone, you know? It, yeah. It's super important. Yeah. I just thought I was really inspired by your playing and I thought, you know, what, a better opportunity where we can't go and see someone physically but we can mm -hmm. use technology to reach out to people and it's becoming more kind of socially acceptable to pop someone a message that you haven't talked to before mm -hmm. to be like hey i like your work and um you know someone said something to me recently that was like um we as artists you know we we don't have that kind of resonance from an audience in a way we don't feel like um I don't know, it's harder to feel like your work is being appreciated and recognized, but yeah. we can use this platform and the time that we have and the technology that we're very lucky to be able to use to connect with people mm -hmm. in new ways. And I think, you know, that's why not take, you know, take advantage of what we have available to us. Totally. And I would like to see more of that. I would like to see people, you know, people, it's, people sit and they, you know, if you're a flutist, you sit and you watch flute players play. You do. You know, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just it's just a thing. You know, we want to see what's going on. We want to see our peers. We want to listen to them. I want to lift them up and see them play beautifully. And, you know, I would like to see that if that more people actually engage with the things that they like, mm. you know, mm -hmm. like I find super interesting. People will tell you really fast what they don't like. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always about what, what's negative and what's bad and what not to do. But what, you know, and I think about this in my teaching too. Like, what do I, what do I like? You know, what do I, what do I, what, 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 what moves me? What, what pulls me towards it? You know, mm -hmm. and if, 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 if it's a friend of mine, I will pick up the phone mm -hmm. and be like, yes, queen, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, because nobody does that, you know? Mm -hmm. No, nobody. Mm -hmm. And it's really unfortunate. And I find, but what I found in the, in the recent uh, weeks and months now is that people are feeling more prone and okay with the notion of celebrating others, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. particularly those who are putting themselves out there and just creating because they have to, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 
And, you know, and I think it's important. I think, and I, I try to tell my students this, like, you know, let's, let's, let's lead with positivity. Let's lead with what we like about this, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I find that very problematic. And I, but, but, but conversely, like this time, oh, Clara, <laughs> mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> Um, she's my favorite. Oh, oh, she's the best. she's the best. Um, talk about a queen. <laughs> um, but you know, like, w w I I want my students to learn this now. Mm. You know, yeah, that like it, it's let's lead with positivity and let's like reach out to people mm. and and let's engage with them in a positive way. You know, mm. yeah, um, mm -hmm. because people are so critical of each other and so negative always. Yeah. You know, but, you know, I think a lot of that comes from this sort of overwhelming sense of entitlement, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that like, and mm. that's something I've never, I've just, I have like literally none of that in me. Mm. <laughs> it's interesting. You know? Yeah. I think especially in the classical world that, you know, you and I have both, you know, we've, we've done the, the master classes and all the, you know, competitions and auditions and all mm. that kind of thing. And something that was really clear to me, you know, I've, I've just graduated from Guildhall. And I want to talk to you about that. I'm really, I want to know how that, how that's going. Mm. Well, it's, it's really one thing that was made so clear to me was when I was at Guildhall, I was measured purely on, okay, what are you doing? What did you win? What are you mm -hmm. better at than other people? And it was so cutthroat. It was so, oh, I'm better than you. And oh, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And it was so, I found that emotionally exhausting and my, yeah. my, my kind of self-worth uh, in that respect was kind of viewed just in this tiny box of, you know, what checklists are you doing and how mm -hmm. much are you doing mm -hmm. productivity, productivity, but quantity rather than quality. And I found that really difficult. And then actually being able to step away from that. And that's one of the reasons why I decided not to, you know, take the, the offer that they gave me to go back was because mm -hmm. I wanted to feel like I had control over the projects that I wanted to do. And I wasn't yeah. kind of being dictated, you know, this is the way. And if you're not doing it this way, then you're wrong, which is a really, really- Rubbish. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, completely. It's like, it's all, yeah. You know, it's, I just don't understand and it's always like, it's like, it, it, I always find like, it's like the people who are feeding that rubbish are the ones who have done very little yeah, or have done one thing. Mm, mm. And it could be very well and, you know, no tea, no shade, but like, I find that those, it's, and that's what I mean about like, the, it's, it's kind of the institution's responsibility to put the right people in the right places and like connect them to the right students, you know? Mm, mm. Like, how is it, for, how is it for you? Like, you know, I have struggled a lot with the notion that like, people want to put me in some sort of kind of box, you know? Like, you play contemporary music very well. That's all that you do. How do you, how, how do you manage that? I think that's a really hard thing because I, I guess there's two sides to it because in a way, being able to say, hey, I do this, means that people who are looking for people who do that are going to go more towards you than someone who yep. doesn't acknowledge that kind of specialism or aspect of their playing. but that you, it's to, yeah I totally relate you know like being put in a box like oh you're a contemporary you know or, or you're an improviser and then immediately mm -hmm. especially from people who don't who maybe haven't had experience in improvisation for example before and that they kind of project these ideas of oh it's, it's a lesser music or it's yeah um, exactly and I find yeah. that bizarre because surely the the most interesting thing to me is the spontaneity spontaneity I can't speak <laughs> the spontaneity of creativity. You haven't even been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, are you sure it's just, it's just tea? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Maybe. No, um, <laughs> but yeah, that that's what I love about improvisation is that you know there's such yeah. a spontaneous amount of creativity that in a way you don't. Um, necessarily have because you know you're tipping boxes and you're making things in the right places with pieces and you know there's an aspect of that that you don't have in improvisation and that can be very freeing um, mm -hmm. I was talking with someone yesterday um, as well about how we can use improvisation um, because there are no kind of expectations or they don't have to be with improvisation you can just bring yourself and you can be yourself mm -hmm. and that can be a wonderful way that we could you know use as some action to bring in people from you know different walks of life and to kind of facilitate that connection in a new way because yeah, yeah. you know 
the, there's no restrictions, there's no, you know, there's no tick boxes, and that might be a nice way mm -hmm. to start, you know, including more people. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I, I just, I, the reason why I was, I really wanted to ask you that question is because, like, it's, like I said, it's something that I struggled with, like, coming from, like, my generation where um, it's all about market value, you mm -hmm. know, and, like, when I was a student, um, the fact that, you know, I didn't burn for a principal flute job mm -hmm. meant that something was wrong with me, and, like, literally, literally, someone said, well, something is either something's wrong with you or you really should want to do something else. And I was like, I just want to do more things, not something else, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I w I'm just really curious about like, like how is it these days, these days that like, you know, where there, there are, because like when I was in my twenties, uh, there were a handful of like full-time new music ensembles and they were all in Europe. Mm -hmm. London Symphony, you had an ensemble modern, Clown Fondin, and it wasn't the landscape didn't look like it did now, you know, yeah. where there's people are coming out of school playing like Fernie Howe, like nobody's business and, you know, burning for this music and wanting to collaborate in different ways. And that it's like amongst yourselves, it's valued, mm. you know. Mm. And when, when I was a student, that wasn't the case. I mean, I I'd sort of fell into a full time new music position. Um, for coming from my education background in the States that was very new music sort of oriented. Um, and being in Germany where it was very orchestral oriented, but I was able to find ways in order to flex that muscle quite regularly. Um, but in Germany, it wasn't valued at all. Like it was, it's really like, you're considered a second class citizen if you don't want to, um, you know, play a lot of auditions and feel bad about yourself and then maybe get a job <laughs> somewhere with them. And then, you know, maybe or maybe not be happy you know yeah um or maybe you know and i feel that like now you know knock on wood like my musical life is very very rich and i you know i do a lot of different things but like it, it's like it's like a catch-22 because i guess the devaluation when i was younger and now that like i the new music is my entry point always you know it's like just a skill set but mm. like and i think that like it's brought me a lot of different things like a lot of a lot of collaborations and a lot of connections with people to do a lot of things that i sort of projects that I, um, I curate, but mm. in, to sort of like move in different directions musically and artistically. Um, but I, I'm just wondering how is the, the general vibe of young people leaving school and um, wanting to commit to different ways of music making? Mm, mm. Well, I think there's, there's two things that came to mind. The first being um, we all kind of crave working with other people i think it's, it can be a very very solitary game if you're just doing auditions and you're you know you're feeling rubbish about you know you're just playing beethoven five all day you know <laughs> and you know there's a place for orchestral stuff and that's amazing but also working directly with composers is something that i love you know it's so mm. nice to be able to work with someone directly on making something rather than a lot of the time what we do with when we play music by people who are already dead is, you know, we, we have to second guess. And then that's where a lot of the, it should be this way. It should be this way right. kind of idea comes yeah. from. So I think, I think now, um, you know, certainly from um, my experience, there's been a lot of inclusion and acceptance of new music, not as something necessarily lesser now, which is, you know, very welcome mm -hmm. yeah. and about time, but mm -hmm. um you know, like it's expected that some kind of, um, you know, piece post 1920, which, you know, is still quite old, but um, at least that's something, you know, we're moving in the right direction. It's That's included as part of your final recital or that's included mm -hmm. as part of like a, a technical thing. And I, mm -hmm. I really like that because before, you know, <laughs> there, there's still going to always be people who, will, you know, just play Schumann and, you know, OK, fine. But. Well, that's fine. Yeah, Beautiful exactly. Music. Exactly. I'm I'm obsessed with Schumann. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, but I think, yeah, in including 20th century, 21st century, working with living composers um, in the mm -hmm. repertoire is something that's definitely being more common now and mm -hmm. something that's being encouraged. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of it might have to do with... Um, funding and I've been thinking a lot about you know I've been doing lots of applications and all these kind of things mm -hmm. recently with th there's a lot of um, monetary support to try and get commissions and there's a lot of kind of mm -hmm. you know encouragement to try and work with 
new works and new composers um, mm -hmm. of a whole, you know, a whole host of different experiences. And um, I think, you know, that's, that's great. I think we need more mm -hmm. of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's a shame that, uh, you know, certainly from where I was coming from in Guildhall, there's still a lot of, um, oh, you, you did some barrier, like, that's very adventurous of you. And, you know, how, how brave of you. And I remember playing some uh, Rebecca Saunders and thinking, you know, everyone was like, why aren't you playing, you know, why aren't you playing Schumann? <laughs> but um, well, I find this so interesting. I find that because, like, from the other side of that, this is one of the reasons why I asked, because, like, if, if I needed to find a second flutist to do a project with me, I'd be really hard pressed to find someone. You know, I would want to look to the, the institutions to find someone young who, who needed the, the experience, but like, it's really hard to find because, you know, I, I don't have time to be teaching these, <laughs> these people, you know what I mean? Like, so that, you know, because people have to play catch up like in mm. the real world, like when they, when they come and they're looking for work and they contact me and I'm like, well, <sighs> You know, first buy, you know, the Karen Levine um, book on extended techniques and then we can talk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And for me, it's easy to say because I've been, you know, I've been doing this since I was like 18 years old. But like, you know, it, it, this is 2020. You would expect that, the, you know, that it would be my cup would be running over with flute players who could do all this stuff. But that's not the case. You know, there's a handful, but like. Mm. And it's good to hear that, like, in certain institutions, it's becoming a part of the curriculum, mm. you know? Yeah. That's really cool to hear. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, it, certainly, you know, at Guildhall, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of new music. And, you know, I was, I made it my purpose in a way to be quite really active in that. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, uh, it, do, it does feel like things are changing and people are interested in new music and it's, because you know you, you if you, you have to explore it then you're going to find all these amazing things and actually there will be something that you know you're really interested in because you know it's yeah. it's it's often still being put in the box isn't it i think you know new music is all these crazy sounds that we we wouldn't yeah, but it's so, like, yeah exactly exactly yeah there's so much diversity in new music you know mm. that's part, part, part of the reason why i sort of still gravitate towards that community because there's like there's so much diversity in, in aesthetic and style and notation and there, therefore is a lot much more diversity and openness to having people who are from different places mm -hmm. and look different and who have different ide musical ideas and there's much more dialogue with mm -hmm. the music and then then in the sort of the standard status quo orchestral sort of full frontal mm -hmm. sort of thing mm -hmm. and i've found a lot of um a, a lot of support in that because like you know i'm who I am and I'm quite unapologetic about it. And being able to sit in in in, uh, in the new music constellation is a kind of a really good fit mm. for a person who who just generally wants to, you know, to be inquisitive and do real work and be mm. really sort of hands on and have real dialogue with people and musicians about real important ideas and move things forward, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I have I have a I have another question for you actually. Um, because it, I'm really curious, like, as a person who deals with a lot of composers, often my, I, I run into the issue of the impracticality of a lot of, of composers because a lot of them aren't working instrumentalists and musicians. But you are a performer composer. And like, what I find very interesting is that like, that is the norm, it should be the norm actually. You know, like Mozart and Bach and they, you know, Schubert and, and Beethoven, they were all performing musicians mm -hmm. who were also composers. It was, a, of course, a much different time, but somehow through, you know, the, the 20th century has created this paradigm in which um, composers are no longer expected to engage with music in a practical sense. Mm. And how do you, as a composer performer, um, sort of deal with those that that sort of reality of how things has have become and how you actually function mm. that's a it's a tricky question because I, I think for for a lot of us as like composer performers or the other way around and it's it's a very personal thing I mean from for mm -hmm. me my process has always been the way the way I used to compose all the time was I would just improvise at the piano mm -hmm. and I would think I would try and just find things that I want to describe or things that just really sit, you know, sat well with me and then mm -hmm. kind of 
you know just manipulating the sound that way but i think there's there's a lot of well certainly kind of like we were talking about with like the entitlement of you know i put something in i get something out attitude um i've been thinking a lot about how we as well I, often in the classical world will be like this composer, you know, they're, they're a prodigy and, you know, they're an amazing deity that we mustn't, you know, upset. And they're kind of put on this pedestal and not kind of mm -hmm. humanized in a way. And I think that mm -hmm. a part of the, the way that composition, in my experience, has been taught is like, well, you know, wow, you're a genius. And then anyone is like, a, you know, a, it's a pleasure for them to play your work. And actually, I, I'm not interested in that. I want to just work with someone and create something. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting dilemma, isn't it? Like academicized ideas of composition versus, you know, this is how we really do it. Um, this is how the real world works. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So I found myself and, you know, I'd encourage anyone that plays just to write something for their instrument. You can learn so much about how you interact and what your habits are and what you feel in your playing and what sits well with you. And um, I th yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I, th I think that's, that's how improvisation kind of came across, uh, came into my life for me as well, mm -hmm. was um, mm -hmm. using that as not only a tool for composition, but also just a tool to figure out more about the clarinet and more about yeah. how other instruments interact with each other. And that's such mm -hmm. a lovely way to hear um, kind of, you know, you can listen to all these amazing recordings and things and you can go to live concerts. But if you're in a place where, um, like I did a conduction ensemble a few years ago, and if you're in a place where people come together and they make any sound that they want, and they're coming from a place of, well, I know my instrument really well. These are the sounds that I can do. I've heard so many crazy sounds that I would have never even yeah. thought of before because these people yeah. are coming in and we're doing like a collective improv or we're doing some mm -hmm. kind of like and I, I just hear all these amazing sounds and yeah. I think that's that's a way that we can try and extend the knowledge of you know what's possible in each instrument and kind of more of an understanding but yeah I, th I think there needs to be more composers working directly with performers and I love that process because that's yeah. that's where interesting work comes from in, in my opinion rather than just like well you would never understand what process I'm doing in this piece but here you go give it a go you know yeah yeah, yeah. I agree I agree I, I um, taught in New Zealand at the University of Auckland for a few years um, and you know, it, it wasn't the easiest time for a, a multitude of reasons, but one of the joys of my time there was I I led um, a class um, for two years of, a, well, the original idea was to start a new music ensemble, but it w became clear to me that the, the levels of, of technical proficiency were so disparate that that wasn't really um, possible. But so I sort of decided to turn that into a improvisation class, mm. like an ensemble that improvised. And it was interesting, like, you know, it, it started off where, you know, there was like one or two people and a lot, I had the support of w one professor in particular who was quite lovely, the violin teacher there at the time. And, um, and it spread like wildfire. I couldn't keep them away. It was fantastic. And being able to like enter into this creative space with no music, with no, no, no text, but just like your creativity and to give them, you know, works like, um, uh, you know, 13 Changes by Paulina Oliveros or like Cobra or, you know, Artificial Life by George Lewis, like introducing them to real composers who also worked in this, this idiom of, um, improvisation, but leading improvisation that like with with the text and that it, it required them to um, engage with real musical ideas like, you know, um, and George Lewis's Artificial Life. I don't know if you've ever played it. It's a masterpiece. I, think. I haven't. No. Um, you know, it's something that you guys 100% have to play because George Lewis is a genius. He is like the best. And this piece is something that I performed a lot and it it really um, helped us also with our dynamic as an ensemble, as a group of people, you know, you, you discover that why is it that one person always starts and that same person always ends the improvisation, you know, mm -hmm. like that's like the dynamic of the ensemble and let's talk about that, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and why is that problematic and being able to, for, for these young people, I, you know, I really worked hard to 
um, engage with them in a very musical way. Like we were talking about very specific musical ideas in the context of improvisation, but like like listening and like tuning and you know playing with each other and learning other people's instruments and learning how to respond honestly. Um, and it was for me an amazing experience. And for them, I know that they were all, they would leave every week like, like resonating completely different you know mm. i think it's super important i mean that's the closest i personally got to composition you know mm. um impro improvisation mm -hmm. um, i've never with the exception of a few like classes in which i had to write down music and and you know not to speak of theory and all those things but like um i've 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 that's the the, the direction which i've only i've really sort of dabbled in the creating of music i i find that like I'm like a ballet dancer, like a really well-trained ballet dancer, you know, like I, I, I'm good at being people's work being put on me, mm. you know, or people working with me as a tool, as an expressive tool, you know, mm. mm -hmm. um, but that also is sort of like a, a huge responsibility artistically, mm. you know, because yeah. like through you, through you, um, the music lives and you, you know, one is as a vessel is is creating a performance practice in real time mm. and you know yeah it's it's a it's a it's kind of a big deal i find it's very important work like yeah. you say working working with interpreters i think it's from our side too as from the inter interpreter's side it's it's mm. super important and intense work and we, we we see so many examples of it from you know from beethoven's time to our time of you know music living through people and th those people being advocates for works and composers mm. and how is it with you like you know are there do you find that there are composers that you're drawn to and that you work really closely with them like in this symbiotic way like a great example in in the flute world is Camilo Hoytenga and Kaya Sariajo like she has written everything for flute for this one person mm. and it has really changed the landscape of to performance practice. Mm -hmm. And I've been very lucky to be able to work with both of them quite intensely. And mm -hmm. I, you see it, you feel it, you smell it, mm -hmm. you know? Like, mm -hmm. it, 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 are there composers that you sort of gravitate to and really cling on to? Yeah, I think um, a couple of the, you know, <laughs> Weird, I, want, I don't want to say older, but they are kind of older, like the, the Shurinos ah, and the Schumpausens. And... <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? Like a, like the more, the classics of the um, new music world, I guess. Um, but yeah, Shurino yeah. Stockhausen, absolutely, I think, you know, yeah. insanely For good. clarinet, definitely. For clarinet, Stockhausen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah. I, I just love everything about Schuckhausen. I think he was. I have so many issues. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about them. Let's talk about them. <laughs> no, no, let's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, for clarinet, there's a lot of really interesting yeah. repertoire there. But um, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, and then you know, living composers. Um, Derek Douglas Carter, actually, I've loved working with. Um, we had a kind mm. of, we, we hit it off on the wrong foot because I, I asked him to write a piece for me and then um, life got busy and then it was postponed a few times and things. But mm -hmm. eventually I, I ended up, um, you know, we, we get on really well now and it's great and it's fantastic. And yeah. it's been amazing to, to work on um, his pieces. I did a piece of his recently called Chocolate. Um, Work. And I love the title. <laughs> it's really cool. It's really cool. And it was it was one of those times where um, I was able to. I feel like I was doing something really positive in giving his work a voice. And his mm -hmm. this this piece was all about um, kind of growing up for him as a black person and as a you know in that world. And he wrote a poem mm -hmm. about it. And it was it was Beautiful. it was an amazing piece. I love it. And it's very very different mm -hmm. to. Um, you know, there's a lot of text and speech involved, which is um, not something that, you know, we often get to do um, yeah. in the new music world. So, it, I mean, you know, there are a lot of pieces out there, but for me, I haven't done much mm -hmm. speech speech stuff. So that was really cool. Mm -hmm. And I was able to, um, I was really excited to work with him and to give his piece a voice um, here in the UK. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, that was a huge privilege to do that. And, um, and I think it's also our responsibility as interpreters mm -hmm. to go out as we talked about like sort of leading us back to where we began like to doing the work and finding these people mm -hmm. and finding finding not only work that speak to us speaks 
to us and composers that sort of like we jive with, but also sort of taking that extra step and being like, who are these, you know, composers of color? Who are these women composers who I don't know? And why don't I, why don't I don't know them? And mm. let's fix, them, you know, yeah. that's yeah. Rocky. That's great that you've done that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it reminds me of, um, I'm slightly obsessed with Pamela Z's music at the moment. I'm not sure if you know her stuff. But I love her. <laughs> she is amazing. I, I'm obsessed with her um, her piece Bone Music at the moment. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. And it's just the way that she kind of incorporates the idea of improvisation um, and all these amazing crazy vocal sounds and, you know, mm -hmm. electronic processing. And oh, for me, that's right up my street. And she's just an absolutely <laughs> amazing person. But um, yeah, that's awesome. I love to hear that. I, I, you know, that's the that's the thing about New York and that's in London that are so different than continental Europe. That like, mm. there's much. Mm, yeah, you know, there are a lot of composers on continental Europe, but like, I find that like it's like, it's like this. It's like this la layer of composers who are like lauded and put on pedestals and who are like Jesus Christ, and then there's a whole bunch of people who are just pissed off because you know they don't get the opportunities that other people get. You know, mm -hmm. and. Um, and there's, and, but in like in New York and in London is like the stream is a little bit, you know, more even and people are doing really cool stuff. And there isn't this general sense of like, um, this is, what's the good English word for like jealousy, you know, like mm -hmm. people are just down to create and make music and reach out to people and be their true authentic selves without being influenced because that's what's popular, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and like the aesthetic, the aesthetics are like really much wider, you know, mm. in London, New York, for instance. You know, like you can live in New York, and what I loved about living in New York as a flute player of new music is that, like, you know, one day I can be playing my buddy Nico Muley's music, who I is literally my favorite person in the world, quite literally. I love him so much. I talk to him every single day, <laughs> you know, and I play his music, which is what it is. And it's its own thing and it's very unique, but it doesn't sit over here in this like uptown new music, Columbia mm. University, Tristan Marai, Haas sort of thing. It doesn't live it, two completely different lanes of music that's being created right now, mm. you know? Mm. And I love the that dynamicism of that sort of like living and working environment where, you know, and it didn't make me less of a musician because I work with him or with him or with her or with her, you know? It was just what you do. Mm. That mean, means you're just versatile. And mm. you know, that pays, mm. you know? Yeah, yeah I, I, I love that about London too, that like mm. there's just so, such a diverse aesthetic, um, like, you know, tapestry, mm. you know? Mm. It's, yeah, it's an interesting kind of going between art for art versus art for a purpose or for box ticking. And there are so many mm -hmm. kind of variants within that, but um, mm -hmm. I'm much more interested in a lot of ways in creating for the sake of exploration and for, you yeah. know, facilitating something. Box, right? and, yeah, 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 exactly. Rather yeah. than it just being, you know, a box ticking thing. Um, yeah. I have just, um, Instagram has just told me that we have one minute and 42 seconds remaining. Okay. Wow. Really? Already time flies when you're having fun. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's been, oh, time has gone so quickly. Um, but I guess, is there anything in the last minute or so that you'd like to, to say about, you know, tell us about the work that you're doing, your albums and all, all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. oh, so um, the PR thing, um, <laughs> which I'm terrible plug, at. Plug, plug, plug. Yeah. <laughs> plug, plug, plug. Um, I have a new, I have, I'm dropping a new album, <laughs> which is Absolutely. very true. I sort of like in the COVID time, like I decided to, sort of out of the whole red sofa experience, I decided to make a, a best of album. It mm. being like, you know, and, and went to the studio a couple of weeks ago and just laid down like a crazy person. Like in like six hours, I like recorded everything. Um, but the Burial Sequenza and um, Cassandra's Dream Song, like, you know, just like the standards that, you know, I feel that I have, some, have something to say and want to put it out there. So that'll be out. Um, hopefully in November, December. And just, you know, if, if all continues to be as they are at this moment, then I have some concerts coming up, which is really cool. Um, mm. And we'll see where we go from there, you know, day by day. Yeah. Some teaching, I have a new teaching job and some new students, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, a lot of responsibility and 
it's nice to have these conversations to keep me sort of like mm. awake, woke, as the kids say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, that's that's <laughs> awesome. And maybe you could send me some links, and I can you know share them around and things. I've got five seconds left. Thank you so okay. much, Eric. Thank You're the you. best. You're the best. And I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs>